those of you watching, thank you again for checking us out this morning at Fresh Vision uh, Calvary Chapel here in El Paso, Texas. Uh, I really uh, do appreciate you checking out, uh, clicking on the link and uh, checking us out. If you like us, if you like what you heard, what you saw, please uh, let us know. We want to hear about it. And also, you know, we just invite you to share the message out there. So today, as you can see, Joshua chapter 28, I mean, yeah, chapter 10, verse 28, and we're going to be covering all the way to chapter, the end of chapter 12. But uh, I've titled today's message, Conquest in Every Direction. Conquest in Every Direction. So while you're turning to Joshua chapter 10, let me just share a few things here. If you were with us, last week in that first section of chapter 10 there we ended that chapter that section ended by telling us about the fate of five kings who went out to battle Israel those kings were executed um, and buried in the same cave that they had been hiding in now, after they, di after they died, after they were executed, their debts not only gave Israel control of those cities that they ruled, but it also meant that now they were also in control of pretty much the central part of the land. Now, this is a great first start, but now they had a bigger task ahead of them. They had to keep fighting. They had to keep conquering. They had to keep taking over that land that they had been promised. So yeah, they had to fight to take over those cities in their south, in their north, in their east, and in their west. Now, besides the battles of Jericho and Ai, the battle of Gibeon that we read about is really, that's really the last battle. That's really the last battle in the book of Joshua that gives a detailed account of things that went on in that fight, from everything from the strategy to, you know, just the, the details about it. But here now... From this point forward, only basic summaries are given. And so today, in the chapters, in the two and a half chapters we're going to be covering, we're going to be reading how God continued to give Israel victory over those great cities that now surrounded them. Now, yes, as I mentioned, there's going to be a lot of reading. We're going to be doing a lot of reading and this is the first time I think that I'll be actually covering this much, uh, this much in, in one book. But what I hope to draw out in this message, in today's passage, are the various lessons. The various lessons that we can learn, that you can learn as believers. So after we pray... God to bless us this morning as we open up his word. We're going to be reading about how Israel conquered the southern cities. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have us here, Lord, that you brought us all here. You have us here all for a reason and purpose. We believe that. And so I pray that that purpose be known, that everything that's going on in our own personal lives, that it just, good or bad, that it just will fade away, Lord. And that now as we sit at your feet to hear your word, that you will show us the things that we need to see. May we hear the things that you want us to hear, Lord. We want to draw near to you. We want to have a deeper relationship with you, God. And we know that the only way that can happen is by really listening intently to your word. 
Or, and although there's these passages for many it may seem just really small and insignificant, we know that your word is powerful. And even in these chapters, it still can change lives and relationships and hearts and minds and save people from destruction. So speak to us now, Lord. And speak to those that are watching and listening to this message as well. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we begin again in this in the last section of chapter uh, ten with the southern those southern cities. So let's go there now and follow along as I read from verse twenty eight. Joshua chapter 10, verse 28. Where God says, On that day Joshua captured Makeda and struck it down with a sword, including its king. He completely destroyed it and everyone in it, leaving no survivors. So he treated the king of Makeda as he had the king of Jericho. Joshua and all Israel with him crossed from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. The Lord also handed it and its king over to Israel. He struck it down, putting everyone in, its, in it to the sword, and left no survivors in it. He treated Libna's king as he had the king of Jericho. For Libna, Joshua, and all Israel with him crossed uh, to Lachish. They laid siege to it and attacked it. The Lord handed Lachish over to Israel, and Joshua captured it on the second day. He struck it down, putting everyone in it to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. At that time, the king, at that time, King Horam of Gezer went to help Lachish, but Joshua struck him down along with his people, leaving no survivors. Then Joshua crossed from Lachish to Eglon, and all Israel with him. They laid siege to it, attacked it, and attacked it. On that day, they captured it, struck it down, putting everyone in it to the sword. He completely destroyed it, on, in, destroyed it that day, just as he had done to Lachish. Next, Joshua and all Israel went with him, went with him, went, well, with him, went up from Eglon to Hebron and attacked it. They captured it, struck it down with its king, all its villages and everyone in it with the sword. He left no survivors, just as he had done at Eglon. He completely destroyed Hebron and everyone in it. Finally, Joshua turned toward Debir and attacked it. And all Israel was with him. He captured it, its king, and all its villages. They struck them down with the sword and completely destroyed everyone in it, leaving no survivors. He treated Debir and its king as he had treated Hebron and as he had treated Libna and its king. <coughs> So Joshua conquered the whole region, the hill country, the Negev, the Judean foothills, and the slopes, with all their kings, leaving no survivors. He completely destroyed every living being as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua conquered everyone from Kadesh, Barnea, to Gaza, and all the land of Goshen, as far as Gibeon. Joshua captured all those kings and their land in one campaign. Because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. As I alluded to earlier, the defeat of the five kings and their armies basically sealed the doom of southern Israel. In a series of quick raids, Joshua attacked the key military centers themselves to destroy any further military capability. Again, as the passage mentions, took Makeda, Libna, Lachish, and Eglon. These cities, roughly, ranging roughly from north to south, guarded the approaches to the southern highlands. Joshua next drove into the heart of the southern region and defeated its two chief, its two chief walled cities, Hebron and Debir. Now, the extent of Israel's campaign in the south is summarized in verses 40 and 41. 
the region of Goshen, not the uh, Goshen in Egypt, was probably in the area around Debir. It was probably the area, um, sorry, it was probably the area around Debir in southern Canaan. A town named Goshen was one of 11 towns in the hill country, which included Debir, and perhaps the area was named for the town. Now, getting back here to, to the passage, this impressive sweep of victories recorded in this chapter, this section, is giving credibility by the statement again in verse 42. Joshua captured all the kings and their land in one campaign. And this is the main point here. This is what you see reoccurring, a reoccurring theme here in, in this section. And in these chapters we're going to be reading as well. Because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Well, chapter 10 ends by informing us confidently that, that confidently Joshua and his tired army returned to Gilgal to make preparations for completing, to complete their next task. Now, in this section, there are three things I want you to keep in mind about what we just read. First of all, it's important to keep in mind that the only reason Israel effortlessly beat their enemies over a wide territorial expanse was because God had fought for it. Again, the words at the end of 42, verse 42 are essential. And it's basically the same words found in verse 14. And so again and again, the book of Joshua reminds us, those of us reading this book, that God is in control of all events. So even as you see the craziness that's going on there right now at this very moment in Israel, God is still in control, church. Secondly, it's also important to remember exactly who these kings are. Joshua portrays them clearly as steadfast opponents of God's plan for his people. Rulers willing to make alliances and muster armies to completely annihilate Israel. So in essence, they seek to do to Israel what Israel intends to do to them. Complete annihilation. Now here's what's interesting. There's a lot of Jews out there today that might compare them I compare these nations to the nations that they're now facing. Those, maybe those terrorist leaders, uh, you know, other nations that are seeking out to, to destroy them. And even Adolf Hitler. While Christians, on the other hand, might compare these, those nations to Nero in the first century or maybe other brutal dictators that have sought to wipe out Christianity in their nations, in their countries, in their areas. But I personally don't see it that way. In my view, the religious freedom that Western Christians, that we as American, American Christians enjoy, sometimes... It blinds us to the fact that truly evil people still exist. And that their not so subtle goal is to stop the spread of Christianity. To stop the spread of the gospel. Now, yes, there are other parts of the world that are in fact that... that, that uh, there are, in fact, many Christians out there in other parts of the world who do suffer under the cruel actions of their own Amorite kings. But my point, again, is we shouldn't compare us to them. We can't say, well, that, 
you know, for instance, this is an example again, you know, that country Russia, Putin, the Chinese, you know, they're like those Amorite kings. No, uh, again, I see it differently, you know, again. Uh, I hope I made it clear. Um, I could explain further, but I'm trying to get, through, again, a lot of information I'm trying to get through here. And so another thing that we mustn't forget that's important here to keep in mind is that the final consummation of history, my friends, involves the destruction of God's enemies. I'm not sure if you are aware of this, but there are scenes in John's revelation that are even more horrible than those in Joshua chapter 10. Maybe, again, reading this, watch, watching this and uh, reading this and, and, and saying, man, how could God approve of genocide? I've covered this before in previous sections and previous chapters, but there was a reason and purpose behind that. I'll briefly touch on it, but again, there is a lot more... Uh, images, events that are going to be happening that we're told about in Revelation and those in this chapter. But here's my point. While no Christian should ever be comfortable with violence, it is helpful to remember that chapter 10 reflects its own ancient culture. In other words, it should be accepted that it should be accepted on its own ancient terms and that God's warfare against evil, it still has one final climactic chapter that's planned for the future. He will deal with all evil. Everything that you might have seen so far happening there in Israel on social media, all the horrible, evil, disgusting things, I, I've seen some of it, it'll all be dealt with. God will deal with all that evil. But again, it's going to happen in its own time, when he's ready, when it's time, when he has, and is, you know, in his perfect timing. Again, let me reiterate this point. God has been and will always be in control. There's nothing outside his knowledge. He's bigger than every man's plan. We, we talk about every day, I know my wife and I do, about plans, things that we would like to do. You know, again, next week we're going to say, for fun, we're saying, hey, why don't we go to San Antonio? That would be cool, you know. And sure, we can plan it to, you know, every you know, every minute of it. But we know that ultimately God's in control. He knows what's happening. So if you're that kind of person that likes to plan every minute and every, you know, every detail to anything that you do, if you're that regimented, just keep in mind, that again, everything happens according to God's plan. So it's important, again, to, to just pray. You know, if it's your will, Lord, May this be so. May that be so. The Bible tells us about that. And God's in control, my friends. All right, so now as we get into the next chapter, the narrator will now tell us about Israel's conquest of the northern cities. So let's go to chapter 11. Joshua chapter 11. When King Jabin of Hazor heard this news. He sent a messenger, a message to uh, King Jobab of Madan, the king, the kings of Shimron and Achshaph, and the kings of the north in the hill country of Araba, south of Chinnereth, the Judean foothills, and the slopes of Dor to the west the Canaanites to the east and west, the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, 
and the Jebusites in the hill country, and the Hivites at the foot of Hamron, Hermon, in the land of Mitzvah. They went out with all their armies, a multitude as numerous as the sands on the seashore, along with a vast number of horses and chariots. All these kings joined forces. They came and camped together at the waters, or the waters of Mermam, and to attack Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, for at this time tomorrow I will cause all of you, all of them, to be killed before Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and all his troops surprised them at the waters of Merom and attacked them. The Lord handed them over to Israel, and they struck them down, pursuing them as far as greater Sidon and Miss Rephathmaim, and to the east as far as the valley of Mitzpah. Mitzpah. They struck them down, leaving no survivors. Joshua treated them as the Lord had told them. He humstringed their horses and burned their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back, captured Hazor, and struck down its king with a sword because Hazor had formerly been the leader of, these, of all these kingdoms. He struck down everyone in it with the sword, completely destroying them. He left no one alive. Then he burned Hazor. Joshua, Joshua captured, captured all these kings and their cities and struck them down with the sword. He completely destroyed them as Moses... The Lord's servant had commanded. However, Israel did not burn any, any of the cities that stood on their mounds except Hazor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites plundered all the spoils and cattle of the cities for themselves, but they struck down every person with the sword until they had annihilated them, leaving no one alive. Just as the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, Moses commanded Joshua. This is what Joshua did leaving nothing undone of all the Lord had commanded, of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took all this land, the hill country, all the Negev, all the land of Goshen, the foothills, the Arabah, the hill country of Israel with its foothills, from Mount, from Mount Halak, which ascends to Seir as far as Balgad in the valley of Lebanon at the foot of Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. Joshua waged war with all these kings for a long time. No city made peace with Israel except the Hivites, who inhabited Gibeon. All of them were taken, all of them were taken in battle, for it was the Lord's intention to harden their hearts so that they would engage Israel in battle, to be completely destroyed without mercy. And be annihilated, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time, Joshua proceeded to exterminate the Anakim from the hill country, Hebron, Debir, Anab, all the hill country from Judah and of Israel. Joshua completely destroyed them with their cities. So no Anakim were left in this land of the Israelites, except for some remaining in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. So Joshua took the entire land in keeping with all the Lord had told Moses. Joshua then gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. After this, the land had rest from war. Now, let me just say, I, it's important, if you haven't been part of our church for a while, or you haven't, you know, I, when we cover every book, when we cover a book in the Bible, we read every chapter, you know, regardless of how, you know, it sounds or how it looks or how simple it is, we're going to be covering it. And so it's important that, because we believe here that, it's important that you read it for yourself because, again, the Lord has a message in every part of his word for you. So, again, that's why we cover it all. Now, 
the alarm of the northern Canaanite kings, it rang out. It rang out because of Joshua's crushing victories in the south. Jabin, the king of Azor, solicits the help of other kings in the northern part of Canaan to assist them in preventing Israel from completely conquering Canaan. God orders Joshua to instruct the Israelite army to hamstring the enemy horses and to burn their chariots with fire. Now, this specific act would remove the temptation for Israel to use the horses and chariots in upcoming battles and attribute victory to the, to the newly acquired military equipment instead of God alone. So in case you're wondering why that's in there, and God, we must understand that God here is getting all the credit. He is the one who gave the victory. He is the one who went out and beat these people. He was just using Israel as an instrument, as a tool. Now, verse 4 describes the combined size of their rival's army in the following way. They went out with all their army, armies, a multitude as numerous as the sand on the seashore, along with the vast number of horses and chariots. I've been to many beaches and many sands and along the seashore. I can tell you that's, that's a lot of sand. That's, that's a lot of sand. So I can just imagine how crazy that image must have seemed at that time to all those people, all those horses. Now Israel had a history of not needing horses and chariots so far, as far as we've read in this chapter, in these in Joshua, in their quest to possess the inheritance in Canaan. They, had, they didn't need them. They defeated Jericho without horses and chariots, and the walls came tumbling down. They even destroyed Ai during the second battle and burned the city. They eliminated the southern five-king confederacy and turned king's hiding into their into the, that king, those king's hiding place, into their mausoleum. Now, they disseminate the kings and their kingdoms during the northern conquest. Let me say this. We may feel tempted to bypass the book of Joshua because of these reports of violence, of annihilation, of extermination, we must remember that God is a merciful God. He's merciful, holy, and righteous. And the Canaanite cities were overrun with sin and devoid of any desire to accept God's grace or knowledge or acknowledge His patience. The locals were like thieves practicing their crimes in the presence of law enforcement. For a long while, the officers could see, but were lenient, hoping the criminals would change their behavior. But after patiently waiting for change, the officers finally incarcerated the criminals. Should there then be an outcry against delayed justice? Most would look at the situation and understand the punishment came long after the crimes were committed originally. In Canaan, the nations had been sinning in the presence of God of all the earth for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. And they did not repent or renounce their ways. They had, I'm sure, a knowledge of God, and I'm sure that if they really wanted to know more about God, they could have sent representatives to, to, the, to the nation of Israel who had, they had heard about 
ever since God delivered him from Egypt. But they just didn't want to turn from their ways. They knew the basics. They knew what things that God had put in their heart. They knew about sin, but they were just like, whatever. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. So again, yeah, was it delayed justice? You know, people would say, yeah, people, some would say, no, that, but it, it, it needed to happen. Even the formidable Anakim were removed from the land. As noted in the wonderful summary again in this chapter, there in verse 23 it says, So Joshua took the entire land in keeping with all the Lord had told Moses. Did you know that these were the Canaanite giants? These were the Canaanite giants who had originally struck fear in the Israelite spies decades before. Yeah, the story is told about in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28. These were the same people that the Israelites were completely scared of. Church, let me remind you again that all these battles were won without horses and chariots. How is that? It's like today, winning a war, winning a battle without jets, without tanks, without, you know, serious artillery. No. Again, they, they won they won those battles without, without all that stuff. Now, how is that? Again, because the Lord was fighting for Israel. The God who fights for us in Christ Jesus will bring us to a land of eternal rest by His Spirit, my friends. The Lord told Joshua in verse 6, Don't be afraid of them. For at this time tomorrow, I will cause all of them to be killed before Israel. In fact, the Lord influenced these Canaanite kingdoms to fight against Israel by affecting their desire. God knew the desires of their heart, that the desire of their hearts was to oppose Israel at war. As a result, God provided the opportunity for their will to be carried out. Yet, when they fought against Israel, they signed their own death certificates. For in fighting against Israel, who were they really fighting against? They were fighting against God. In verse 20, Joshua recalls, what God had done similarly to Pharaoh and his officials in relation to the Hebrews in Egypt over 400 years prior. For it was the Lord's intention to harden their hearts since they had long hardened themselves against God. See, church, the Israelite army didn't need horses and chariots. Chariots. All they needed was God. God is always enough. He was enough back then, and He's enough right now. His grace is always sufficient. As Paul rhetorically asked, if God is for us, who is against us? It's an amazing verse there in Romans 8.31. The implication is, if God is for us, no one can be against us and win. And I'm talking again about believers, born-again Christians. I'm not talking about America as a nation as a whole. I'm talking about believers, those who trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
who have the Holy Spirit living in them. The Israelites were thoroughly victorious because they were constantly obedient, consistently obedient to their military commander, who was obedient, I'm talking about Joshua, who was obedient to the word of God and the God of the word. Just as the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, Moses commanded Joshua. And that's what Joshua did. Leaving nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Joshua. So similarly, my brothers and sisters in Christ, God calls you as his child to trust and obey him. You see, that's the formula for being successful in the work of the kingdom. That is the formula for being successful in the work of the kingdom, to trust and obey him as his child. Back in Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, the Lord said this, Above all, be strong and very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you will have success wherever you go. The book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night, so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. I gave a whole sermon on that back when we covered chapter 1. I recommend you going back and listening to that. But it's pretty cool. But here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to understand about what's we're saying, what's being said here. Trust and obey, for there is no other way. Trust and obey, my friends, my brothers and sisters, for there is no other way. Joshua will take the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses. And we see once this happens, he'll be prepared to hand out the territory, hand out a territorial, territorial inheritance to each of the tribes according to their tribal divisions. So, finish up here in this chapter. You get it? The God who fights for us, the God who fights for you in Christ Jesus will eventually bring you to a land of eternal rest. By what? By His Spirit. Now this chapter again ends with a peaceful note. The land had rest from war. And that's how chapter 11 ends. So now let's look at what happens after this time of rest. As Israel now, Israel now looks to conquest or conquer the eastern and western territories. Joshua chapter 12. The Israelites struck down the following kings of the land and took possession of their land beyond the Jordan to the east and from the Arnon River to Mount Hermon, including all the Araba eastward. King Sion of the Amorites lived in Heshbon. He ruled from Aror to the rim of the Arnon River, along the middle of the valley and half of Gilead up to the Jabbok River, the border of the Amorites. The Araba, east of the Sea of Chinnereth to the Sea of Araba, that is the Dead Sea, eastward through Beth Jeshimoth, and southward below the slopes of Pisgah, King Og of Bashan, of the remnant of Rephim, lived in Ashereth and 
Ed, Edri. He ruled over Mount Hermon, Salaka, and Bashan up to the Geshurite and Makathite Mac, border and half of Gilead to the border of King Sion of Heshbon. Moses, the Lord's servant, and the Israelites struck them down, and Moses, the Lord's servant, gave their land as an inheritance to the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. This is the territory west of the Jordan. Now, Joshua and the Israelites struck down the following kings of the land beyond the Jordan to the west from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon to Mount Halak, which ascends towards Seir. Joshua gave their land as an inheritance to the tribes of Israel according to their allotments. The hill country, the Judean, Judean foothills, Arabah, the slopes, the wilderness, and the Negev. The lands of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. The king of Jericho, one. king of Ai, which is next to Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Debir, one. The king of Geder, one. The king of Horma, one. The king of Arad, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adullam, one. The king of Makada, one. The king of Bethel, one. The king of Tupa, one. The king of Hefer, one. The king of Aphek, Aphek, one. The king of Lash, Aran, one. The king of Madan, one. The king of Hazor, one. The king of Shimron, Marun, one. The king of Ashif, Ach, Ach, Shaf, one, the king of Tanakh, one, the king of Megiddo, one, the king of Kadesh, one, the king of Jokanim in Carmel, one, the king of Dor in Naphet Dor, one, the king of Goim in Gilgal, one, the king of Tirzah, one, the total number of all kings, 31. That ends chapter 12. All right. Hope you followed along with that. All right. Now, if you're anything like me and enjoy watching good, a good action movie, you may be saying to yourself at this point, that's it? Where is the action and the excitement? Where is the, the drama that is going to be keeping me at the edge of my seat, waiting to see what happens next? Where's the worship here in chapter 12? Where are the actual dramatic events in the book of Joshua? In the rest, in the other, like in the other chapters, the parting water, waters, the falling walls, the burning cities, extension of light and delay of night, and hailstones hurled by the divine. Where are the dramatic cries? from the kings and the people. Well, as we just read, there are none. They're absent from this chapter. However, Joshua chapter 12 has a lot to say to us by what it doesn't directly say to us. I'll give you three. First, this chapter communicates that God makes good on his intentions, or I'm sorry, that makes, makes good on his promises. God makes good on his promises. The Lord promised that if the two tribes of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh fought alongside the nine other tribes, their brothers, fought alongside them there on the west side, then God would give them the land promised to them in the wilderness side of the Jordan. Well, the two tribes, the two and a half tribes, were faithful in their promise. And God was faithful in his provision. So what does this tell us? This tells us that God lavishes blessings on his people who must remember, who must remember to count them. Beginning with his greatest blessing, salvation offered, by Christ through the Spirit. 
Now, some promises and covenants are unconditional, like the Noahic covenant. Noahic covenant. That's Noah's, the covenant of Noah. In that covenant, there in Genesis chapter 9, God promised the whole world would never again be destroyed by flood. However, this covenant, with the, however, um, however, this covenant that we just read about, with the two and a half tribes, is a conditional covenant, contingent on those two and a half tribes doing their, pri- their part. Then, and only then, was the land promised to them on the east side and uh, and then and only then was the land promised to them on the east side of the Jordan it it was definitely theirs if we as believers abide in God and live out his word he will bless us He will bless us, church, with the fruit of His promises found in His Word. I'm not talking about prosperity preaching. I'm not a prosperity preacher. Not at all. We know that we abide in His Word. He will bless us with the fruit of His promises. It's standing on the promises of God in obedience and reaping the benefits of God had promised. God has promised. We, as believers, we reap them according to obedience to His Word, not according to our wishes. Second, this chapter articulates the significance of past experience with God producing present confidence in God. Whenever Israel faced any present challenge or encounter, they could always look back and see how God delivered them in the past. By doing that, this assured Israel that God could surely deliver them in the present. This was the basis of David's confidence when he faced Goliath, the giant, that champion of Philistines. Goliath was shocked that King Saul, a great warrior, would send a youth, a young man with no military experience, who was just a shepherd, who just came to the battlefield to give his brothers sandwiches. He was shocked that the king would send this young man to go out and face him in battle. But David came with experience on serving God, who allowed him to kill a lion and a bear that had threatened his father's sheep. And so David reasoned that if God could help him succeed in the past, God would empower him in the present against Goliath, the uncircumcised giant. So when you as a believer face what appears to be an unconquerable challenge or challenges now in the present, you must rehearse and review your past. You must go back to that place and remember how faithful God was to you and how he rescued you and how the wonderful things that he did in your life how he made himself known to you. You must dust for divine fingerprints in your biographies in order to remember what God was, that God was with you in the past and will be with you now in the present. You hear that? No matter what you're going through right now, I know many of you are going through a lot of stuff. Go back and remember. 
Go back and remember how faithful he was to you. And that should help you. It should give you the courage, the strength to deal with what's going on now. And this should give you great confidence in God. Thirdly, this chapter clearly and powerfully makes the undeniable statement that there is no failure in God. There is no failure in God. God inspires a writer to list the kings of the territories Joshua and the Israelites conquered on the west side of the Jordan. The names run like credits at the end of a movie. And many of us, many of you, I know I do, we skip right through it. We just stop the movie and, you know, that's it. And so they, those names may seem unnecessary. Why doesn't the author just settle with the fact that of what he already said in chapter 11, verse 23? Well, the author takes the extra step, extra step, step of the territories these kings ruled in fact, in verse 24, they are counted and numbered. They're counted and numbered. And 31 kings in all, 31 kings were defeated. Some of those territories were readily known even through the name, even though the name of the king is omitted. Jericho, Ai, Jerusalem, and Bethel. Other names are unfamiliar. Yet God inspires a writer to list these names in chronological order based on how they fell to the swords of Joshua and the Israelites. So you see, church, here's, here's where I'm getting at. Our God is an omniscient God. Our God is an omniscient God. And what does that mean? He's an accountant. He keeps track of numbers. Likewise, God's people should be accountants too. What do I mean by that? I can't be an accountant. My wife's the house accountant. I can't, no way I can, you know. But here's the thing. God lavishes blessing, lavishes blessings on his people who must remember and count them beginning again with his greatest blessing, salvation offered through Christ, through the Spirit. So as we consider what is before us, we must remember what is behind us. All of you, each and every single one of you, have a testimony. If you would only just stop and tell someone about it. As a believer, each one of you have the responsibility to join the believer's accounting firm and count your blessings. You know what it says in Psalm chapter 56, verse 8? It's a beautiful psalm. I have it on my Facebook, that thing you put on top, the passage or the picture there, says that God puts our tears in bottles so that he knows the weight of the many tears we have shed. For God, tears are liquid love and a language he understands. So let me ask you, how many tears had flown, had flowed from your cheeks. Tears over relational rifts, over tragic and premature deaths. Tears over devastating habits. Well, God keeps track. Keeps track. He knows every single one of my tears that I cried. Every single one of the tears my wife has cried, and yours as well. And then as if to emphasize this, 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, but even the hairs of your head have all been counted. He knows all about you. God knows everything about you. God also keeps track, keeps a track of souls that are added to his kingdom as well. Luke writes in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, So those who accepted his message were baptized on that day, and, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. The Lord put your name in the Lamb's book of life as one of the innumerable hosts of saints approaching the heavenly throne. There in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, those of us that have, again, have our names written in the book of life, says there that we've washed, who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so surely, since God is that meticulous about keeping up with details seemingly so mundane, then he's even more meticulous about keeping up with our heartaches and our pain. He takes account. He, he knows everything. And so the listing of the 31 king demonstrates Joshua and the Israelites' total victory. Jesus Christ came to bring about total victory too. When he said in John chapter 19, verse 30, when he said there that it is finished, he meant that everything had done, everything he had done, meant that everything he had, everything he had done, again, I guess I'm getting a little tongue-tied here, it meant that everything, his fa- he had done everything he sent his, fa- uh, his father sent him to do. He had done everything his father sent him to do. Every enemy was defeated. And the last enemy, death, was given notice of utter defeat. Jesus, if you didn't know this already, took the sting out of death. And his resurrection by the Spirit robbed the grave of its victory. Like Joshua, he left nothing undone. As the Old Testament, Joshua completed his work and addressed all he was to do. So the New Testament, Joshua, our Jesus, our Savior, will complete his work and leave nothing undone. So right now, at this very moment, Jesus is interceding for his spiritual siblings, you and me as our great high priest. The ministry of salvation and redemption is complete. However, the ministry of intercession is ongoing. Hebrews 7.25 says that Jesus is high priest who always lives to make intercession for us. We as God's children survive And we survive alone because he is interceding and praying for us. And so we are to follow his example and also leave nothing undone. And so so to wrap it up here, Joshua chapter 12 is a resounding announcement to Christians, to you and I, that face foe after foe, challenge after challenge. My friends, God is our mighty fortress This list is an example of our need to recount as Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 through 17 says, or as as is that list in in Matthew chapter 1. In that list which believers might skip in order to get to the meat of the book, that there is a story of all of us. Read those names. Look at their history. Read what they went through. We the kind of people they were. Regardless of our origins, our pasts, 
our sins or our failures. We, you, my brother and sister, are important to God who lavishes his blessings on you and on me. So let me end with this. We must remember and count them. Remember and count those blessings, beginning again with that greatest blessing. Begin there. Salvation that you were given by Jesus. Remember that, my friends. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you that you've given it to us. Thank you that you've allowed me to give me the privilege to not only read your word publicly, Lord, but share the message that's behind these words. And I pray that it did the work that it was intended to do, Lord. I know that there was a lot covered here, Lord, but I believe and I know that there was something in here for everyone. Whether it was in chapter 10, 11, or 12. Maybe somebody needed to hear all of it. So I pray that the seed was planted and that it would eventually grow into beautiful fruit. If you're watching and listening to this and now want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to the cross of Jesus. And there before him, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. Believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.